Good morning. Good morning. Stand with us and sing, please.
the world, and they that dwell there within. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath cleansed his hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn to see He shall receive the blessings of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Let's sing together.
truly honored and privileged to the fact that we were able to be in your presence due to an incredible relationship that we get to have with you. God, we thank you for your holiness that makes us holy. God, we thank you for your incredible love, your daily blessings. And now the privilege that we have to dive into your word and to be challenged and changed in some amazing way. So when we walk out those doors today, God, we can be transformed, changed in some way to be more like you and less like we were when we walked in here. Bless us now. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. It's uh, our privilege today to have uh, Mike Shaw as our chapel speaker. Many of you may know him from uh, his times uh, as Teen Leadership Conference speaker, and he's doing that again this summer. Uh, but Mike is a 1992 graduate of, of here. Uh, he spent 22 years on staff in a variety of capacities, admissions counselor, uh, athletic director, and most notably as our men's basketball coach. And uh, just this past fall, he was inducted into the, uh, the Defender Hall of Honor. So you might have seen him here earlier. Um, it's been neat for me as, as a friend of his to see his growth. Uh, I remember as a freshman here at CSU, uh, Mike came with his parents. His, his, his dad left Scroon Lake, New York, where Mike grew up, uh, to come here as a married student to, to finish his degree at then BBC. And Mike was a high school senior and most notably found him in the gym over there, uh, but became friends over the years. It's been neat to see him uh, as he dated his now wife, Val, who is also an alum. Uh, they have six children, and uh, their uh, future daughter-in-law is here. She's also an alumnus of the school, and so it's great to have him. Three things real quickly that I appreciate about uh, Mike Shaw. Number one is his passion. I think you'll see that today, his passion for God, uh, for his family, his, his passion for pursuing excellence in all that he does, including uh, in the sports uh, world. Uh, secondly, uh, I think you'll see what I call his authenticity. He's the real deal. What you see is what you get. He's very transparent, and he's the real deal. And in a world that we are surrounded with with a lot of fake people and a lot of fake things, it's uh, refreshing to have uh, a real person who is transparent and authentic, and I think you appreciate that. And, and finally, I think I appreciate most his faithfulness, um, faithfulness to God, uh, his faithfulness to his wife, Val, his faithfulness to his family, and his faithfulness to serving God uh, through his life, uh, and through athletics. So let's welcome a good friend and brother in Christ, Mike Shaw. Thank you, Gordon. <clears throat> well, good morning. Okay, that was terrible. Good morning. morning. It's a little better. I am excited to come back home. I've always considered this place home. And it was uh, a joy to get up this morning at 4.45 to get on the road to come here in time for chapel. <clears throat> I've been praying about what to share with you this morning from the Word of God. And uh, God's laid it upon my heart to, I'm just going to be, ironically, Paul, you talked about being authentic. I'm going to share with you some things I struggle with. <clears throat> How many of us have had a bad day? You've had a day when you've said, my day stinks. It's not going right. It's not going the way I want it to. So therefore, I'm going to be grumpy. I'm going to be short with people. I'm going to have kind of a get away from me, I don't like you attitude. Can you guys relate to that? I'm a principal at a private school we have 300 kids K through 12th grade. I do all the discipline. I'm not liked at my school because I get the privilege to tell people what they're doing wrong and nobody wants to do, nobody admits to doing anything wrong. I want to share with you a book that I like to read. I used to read it to my kids when they were little. So I'm going to read it to you today. Maybe you can relate with this gentleman named Alexander. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. They made a movie about it. I'm going to read this book to you and see if you can relate. He says, I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on a skateboard. And by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast, Anthony found a Corvette Stingray car kit in his breakfast cereal box. And Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his breakfast cereal box. 
But my breakfast cereal box, all I found was breakfast cereal. He says, I think I'll move to Australia. In the carpool, Mrs. Gibson let Vicky have a seat by the window. Audrey and Elliot got seats by the window too. I said I was being scrunched. I said I was being smushed. I said, if I don't get a seat by the window, I'm going to be car sick. No one answered. I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At school, my teacher liked Paul's picture of the sailboat better than my picture of the invisible castle. <laughs> At singing time, she said, I sang too loud. At counting time, she said, I left out 16. Who needs 16? I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I could tell because Paul said I wasn't his best friend anymore. He said that Philip Parker was his best friend and that Albert Moyo was his next best friend and I was only his third best friend. I hope you sit on a tack, I said to Paul. I hope the next time you get a double-decker strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream part falls off the cone part and it lands in Australia. There were two cupcakes in Philip Parker's lunch bag and Albert got a Hershey bar with almonds. And Paul's mother gave him a piece of jelly roll that had little coconut sprinkles on the top. My favorite, by the way. Guess whose mother forgot to put in dessert? It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. That's what it was because after school, my mom took us all to the dentist. And Dr. Fields found a cavity just in me. Come back next week and I'll fix it, said Dr. Fields. Next week I said, I'm going to Australia. On the way downstairs, the elevator door closed on my foot. And while we were waiting for my mom to go get the car, Anthony made me fall where it was muddy. And then when I started crying because of the mud, Nick said I was a crybaby. And while I was punching Nick for saying crybaby, my mom came back with the car and scolded me for being muddy and fighting. I'm having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I told everyone, no one answered. So then we went to the shoe store to buy some sneakers. Anthony chose white ones with blue stripes. Nick chose red ones with white stripes. I chose blue ones with red stripes. But then the shoe man said, we're all sold out. They made me wear, buy plain old white ones, but they can't make me wear them. When we picked up my dad at his office, he said I couldn't play with his copying machine, but I forgot. He also said to watch out for the books on his desk, and I was careful as could be except for my elbow. He said, don't fool around with his phone, but I think I called Australia. My dad said, please don't pick him up anymore. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. There were lima beans for dinner. I hate lima beans. There was kissing on TV. I hate kissing. <laughs> my bath was too hot. I got soap in my eyes. My marble went down the drain and I had to wear my railroad train pajamas. I hate my railroad train pajamas. <laughs> when I went to bed, Nick took back the pillow he said I could keep and the Mickey Mouse nightlight burned out and I bit my tongue. The cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not me. It has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My mom says some days are like that, even in Australia. How many of us can relate? Can you relate to that? I think through life, as I was praying on what to share with you from God's word, I was praying, I sat where you sat, where you sit today. I was a student here, albeit it was probably before all of you were born. I came here in the fall of 1988. I'm like, what could I say to me? Because we sit through chapel and we kind of punch a time card and we check out and we're like, yep, that was good, great. Chapel was great today. What'd they say? I don't know. What can I say that you can relate with that you can apply to your life that I needed to hear when I was in your chairs, in those chairs? I want to talk about three responses for the believer in living a life that pleases God. As we talk about every day-to-day -day life. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> we want to look at three commands from Scripture. If you're familiar... Paul's letter to the, Thessal the church of Thessalonica, it was not an easy place to live. It wasn't a great time to be a believer. He shares them how he wants to see them. He talks about living to please God. He talks about God's coming back. How Timothy's report was encouraging to him. 
And he gives some final instructions in the last set of paragraphs of his first letter. And I, I want to focus on one paragraph, verses 16, 17, and 18. He says three commands. He says, be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray as we get in the word of God. Father, I do thank you for who you are. I thank you for salvation. I thank you that we can have a relationship with you. I don't know what I would do without one. I pray, Father, that as your word is opened, I pray that you allow me to get out of your way. You're much more effective that way. I thank you for the power of your word. I pray that you prepare our hearts as your word is declared and that we would apply the practical truths of your word to our life so that we can point people to you and get out of your way. I thank you for these things, Father. I thank you for your faithfulness and your consistency. In Jesus' name, amen. The first response is to be joyful always. I hate the fact that always is at the end of that sentence. What do you allow to rob you of your joy in a day-to-day -day life? Because I've been able to rub shoulders with a lot of Christians. I can't say that this being joyful can be a characteristic of us, although it should be because of the promise we have in Christ. What circumstance do you allow to rob you of your joy? Is your coffee too cold? Something as small as that? Something as small as... It's funny, you know, as students, I, hear, I used to hear them complain about their grades. Well, you're the one that affects that, not the teacher. But yet you complain. Be joyful always. Mr. Golden referenced that we moved here in between my junior and senior year of high school. And as my dad came here, he quit his job as an accountant to come to this school to learn the Bible. We got a realtor. I have not, I can't claim to be a professional. I never hung around realtor's offices, nor do I really want to do that. But it's not much fun if you've ever been around a realtor's office. A lot of stress, a lot of pressure, people going out for smoke breaks all the time. That's not a place that I would say is a characteristic of being joyful. People are yelling at each other on the phone. A lot of pressure. We were told, we were waiting. We were right down here on the main drag at Lavelle Realtor waiting for our realtor to come in. Observing, I'm 16 years old, and I'm observing all these people in this office and nobody's happy. And they said, you'll know who your realtor is. And sure enough, he comes walking in and our realtor was a little bit different than everybody else. I watched him struggle to get out of his car. He had cerebral palsy. His name was Pete. And his right hand was crippled, kind of pulled in. And his right leg didn't work. And he kind of struggled to walk. And I watched him as he parked his car, struggled to walk up the sidewalk of the realtor's office. And he greeted the people that were outside smoking. Good morning. And I don't know if, if you've spent time with the local people here in Northeast PA, being joyful would not be one, a characteristic of them. Good morning. Was the response back to him. And as he continued to struggle walking, there was something different about his countenance. There was something different about his demeanor. And the lady behind the desk said, Pete's here. He's always happy because he's a Christian. Could the same be said about you? Be said about me? Or do we allow our circumstances? People are naturally happy on some occasions, but the Christian's joy is not dependent upon circumstances. It comes from what Christ has done and is constant. 
What is the foundation for your joy? Is it something that you say you want? Is your foundation based upon your convenience? Is it based upon something that you want to get in return? A lot of people say they love God. The minute that they don't get what they want, then that's fickle. It goes. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter's letter is written to the two believers who are scattered because of persecution at the time of Nero. And he says in verse 3, chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth and into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power into the coming of the salvation that is already, that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Stop there. I don't know about you, but if that doesn't fire you up, something's wrong. We have a salvation that we had nothing to do about. We were chosen. Jesus paid it all. God is protecting. It is signed, sealed, and delivered. That should affect our day-to-day responses. But we allow our day-to-day responses to become bigger than the gift of salvation. Our circumstances, we allow them to be bigger. Our hope is in the Lord. But what do you allow you to distract you? Whatever it is. Could be for us as athletes, whether we're winning or losing. Whether we're getting playing time. Whether if I get appreciated or not. Whether I get noticed. If we are to have the joy of the Lord, it needs to be on the right focus. And that focus needs to be on what we have in Christ and the relationship we have that's never changing. Do you realize that? As I sat where you sat a long time ago, I wish I would have realized that and come to that realization earlier than I did. Because God can use you. God can use you even now. Is your joy in the Lord? Or is it only when circumstances are convenient for you? He says, be joyful always. Always. The second response is to be, pray continually. Are you guys like me? Sometimes prayer is the last thing you do, right? Have you ever had a situation or a circumstance that you exhaust yourself trying to fix it and the last thing you do is pray? Has that ever happened to you? It has to be. I'll give you a simple illustration. I've lost, I tend to lose my keys. Has that ever happened to you? Or your phone? Uh, My boss, the guy I answer to at my school, our head of school at McKeel Christian Academy, he's always doing the Macarena. He he forgets everything. He forgets his phone. We had a basketball game this past weekend in our sectional tournament. His wife calls me. She's like, tell Chad, Make sure he keeps his keys, his wallet, and his phone. I'm like, the guy's 52 years old. Why are you calling me? I'm the same way. I exhaust myself trying to find something, and this, it actually happened. I forgot my keys. And my wife was like, did you pray about it? And my response back to my wife is, why would I pray about it? What am I going to do? I got to get going. Be joyful always, right? I finally humbled myself. I prayed. And guess what happened? I found my keys. Pray continually. When we pray, it's an evidence of a humble spirit. I find as believers, we're the most arrogant people in the world. We're proud of our own piety. We're proud. If you just want to know, look at people on Facebook. We're proud of the wrong things. 
There was a country song a number of years ago. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. But as parents, we now talk about our children. And it's justified. It's arrogance. Praying is evidence of a humble spirit that you can't handle it. How often do you pray? When cell phones first came out, you used to get a bill from your phone provider and they would have a list of the numbers that you called. Texting really wasn't as popular as it is today or Snapchat, I guess, back then. You would just get a list of numbers that your phone got dialed. I remember my dad challenging me. If the same thing existed in my communication to God in heaven, what would your phone bill look like? Mike, we do pray, right? God, help this girl to like me. Help this guy to like me. Help me to do well in my game. Help me to do well on my test. Do you ever talk to God just about how great he is? Do you ever talk to God about things you struggle with? Sin that only he knows. Do you ever praise God and thank God when he answers prayer? Praying is evidence of a humble spirit. Praying shows dependence upon God. There's another point that I didn't put in here. Praying also gets our focus right. As we read the story about Alexander, his focus was all on himself. I'm not getting what I want. I'm not this. I'm not that. Praying gets our focus back on the Lord where it belongs. I would suggest to you that that's a big problem in our life. I know it's in my life. When I get unhappy, and I love to complain, I can complain with the best of them. It's because my focus is wrong. In getting on my knees before God allows me to get my focus back on what's important. And I realize the hope that I have which gives me joy despite circumstances. What's your prayer life like? So he says, be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The third response is to be thankful in all circumstances. We struggle with that, right? We struggle. To have an attitude of appreciation, not expectation. When you trade your expectation for appreciation, your worldview instantly changes. But we had too many people. You guys live in a culture that's all about entitlement. You live in a culture, it's all about me getting mine. I get to coach. We're the number four seed in our section. We're a small Christian school, but we play public schools. New York State, we're only a school of 300 kids K through 12, but we've, we've got a pretty good basketball team. The guy who is my boss is the head coach. He's a great coach, got a great history of winning. Last year, we won a state championship in New York schools, class B, because we're private. They bumped us up in the A, so we're playing schools with 350 kids in a class or more. We have 300 in our whole school. No, we're private. We recruit. We're playing this weekend, and a kid on our team who's our leading scorer likes to get his natural it's natural in our culture and in society to want to get mine I got to get mine because I'm the man I got it going on you know he'll make a shot he shoots the arrow quite frankly I would love to get the bow and arrow and shoot him <laughs> I would love to do that but not hit him here hit him here so he comes out of the game and he's frustrated because he's trying to dribble. The other team, you don't think they've scouted us? 
And he's dribbling the ball through three people, and the ball is kicking around all over the place. And he comes to the bench. He's like, I can't handle the ball today. I'm like, that's because you're triple team. How about you? Uh, here's a novel idea. Try passing it. And he looks at me, you know, and of course, I'm the assistant coach. I'm not the head coach. My head coach is like, take it easy, take it easy. I'm like, we got people open, but you ain't passing the ball. Focus is all wrong. We were down 20, we were down 30 to 18. Of course, he decides to pass the ball. Kids make shots. We come back and we win the game. And he says to me, Coach Chow, thanks for yelling at me. I said, your, your mom's not going to say that. <laughs> he said, my focus is wrong. To give thanks in all circumstances. But we'll, we'll, we'll gladly give thanks. But are we thankful for the things that are hurtful to us? That stretch us? You live in a culture today that people don't say thank you, right? Try holding the door for people. I held the door at a local department store for an older person and they just looked at me like, what are you doing? Good morning. Right? Or those of us who do things for people and people don't say thankful, we get mad at them. Right? Sure we do. So, as Mr. Golden said, we had the privilege of serving God here for 22 years. I love this school. And God moved us. We didn't want to leave. Didn't want to leave the area. And we moved to Schenectady, New York. My kids were impacted by that in a great way. We have six kids. Our son had graduated. He was in college, but we had five other kids that went to Abington Heights. And they were, we were so rooted in this community. Probably the child in our family that hated the move the most and resented the move the most. And she let me know quite daily when we moved that she didn't like it. Has benefited from our move the most. She met her husband. She got married this past summer. She's got a great job. That job is paying for her to get her education paid for. She doesn't have to pay for education. She's married. I remember saying to her, you know, they have the daddy-daughter dance, which is one of the most painful things I've ever had to do in my life because I'm trying not to cry because I'm supposed to be a tough guy. That's terrible. I'm trying to dance with my daughter. And I, I looked at her in the eyes, crying, and I said, isn't our God so good? Look what you've had to go through. Johanna, good athlete in high school, Abington Heights, tore ACL twice, tore a meniscus. He was preparing her all along the way for our move. She didn't know it. He says, give thanks in all all circumstances. Do you do that? Are you even thankful for the circumstances that are good? When's the last time you told mom and dad thanks? When's the last time you told your teachers thanks or your coach? Genuinely. Or you showed appreciation. It's a challenge for us because our world doesn't. And if an unbelieving world is supposed to believe in God Almighty, they need to see these things acted out, done out, lived out on a daily basis. I think it's great that our school athletically gets to compete in the NCAA. I know that I follow the sports teams because I am invested here. You know, we haven't been successful. But hopefully, as far as wins and losses, but hopefully they see a difference in how you respond. How you play. How you receive correction. 
so that people can see God. Being thankful demonstrates trust in God. So, our fourth child, third, we have a boy, three girls. Our lat- and then two boys. Our fourth child had some major health issues. She had to be born in Philadelphia. She was operated on an extensive surgery right after she was born. This school really rallied around us as a family prayed with us. Teen Leadership Conference that year, Mads was born August 22nd. They laid hands on us over in the Huckabee Gymnasium. That's where they used to have it back then. And prayed with us. We were crying. My wife and I were bawling. We have our baby. She's operated on. Looks like everything's okay. She was four and a half months old. We have a basketball game. I was coaching and I noticed that something was wrong with the baby because the baby was fussy, abnormally fussy. My wife's trying to sell her down. It's not working. She left. At that time, we were dorm parents on campus in Ridley Dorm. I was the East Region Chair for NCCAA, and so after the game, I was doing some statistical work. And my wife calls me in my office and says, uh, you need to come home. Something's wrong with the baby. Okay, fine. I get home, and I'm, our baby's feet is swollen. She's four and a half months old, so she can't communicate that. And she's twitching. What in the world's wrong with her? Our doctor says, just give her some Benadryl, put her to bed. She might have an allergic reaction. I'm thankful to God that we didn't. We took her down to Scranton, to Mercy Hospital. And basically, she was robbed. She had robbed her body of all the calcium because they took out chunks of her intestines when she was an infant in her surgery. The Children's Hospital. Your intestines intestines absorb vitamins so she basically didn't absorb vitamins A D, E, K and calcium she had robbed her body of all the calcium that it needed she developed rickets and she was going into cardiac arrest we didn't know it, that's why her feet were swelling because her heart was, was misfiring we, couldn't, we didn't know that but that's why the twitchy we get down there they're like we're going to have to life flight her down to Philly it was too foggy. Ambulance drove up, picked her up, and I followed the ambulance. We go down. We're down in Philadelphia for almost two weeks. And we meet some people down there. You're put into a big room with three other children that have cardiac issues. There was a couple there, Todd and Sandy. They were from Allentown, uh, between Allentown and Philadelphia area. And their baby wasn't doing so good and they requested a priest. They couldn't find a priest so I walked around the court and said, I'm not a priest but I'll pray with you. We prayed and we began to have a bond with Todd and Sandy. They weren't believers. Okay, God, you're, that's great. Mads took a turn for the worse. Things weren't going well so they, we had to move from where things were kind of comfortable to it was uncomfortable and we were put like in a, a room with another baby and this baby had been born for almost a year old, hadn't been back to birth weight, had a hole in her heart. All the tubes in ears, nose, mouth, other openings that our body has. She was covered in one of those big things and in our daughter. You look around and you're kind of like, oh boy. And our daughter wasn't doing so good. And in walked the mom of this baby. Her name was Elizabeth. They called her Lizzie. And we got some news that wasn't very positive for us and our daughter. And so my wife is crying. I'm trying to console my wife. And this woman comes over to us and she says, uh, she, she said, can I share with you some things? Sure. She said, Elizabeth, Lizzie, we've had her for almost a year. And I'm going to explain it like this. She said, we have another child who's healthy. And I'm going to explain it like going on vacation to Italy. And we go to Italy, and we love everything about Italy. We love the landscape. We love the food. We love the type of vehicles they drive. 
it's comfortable, the people are attractive to look at. Everything about Italy is pleasing to what we want. That's what we expected where the plane was to land when we had Lizzie. But the plane lands and it lands in Holland. In Holland, the weather is awful. The people wear wood shoes, they're weird. The food is different. It's nothing like we experienced in Italy and we're struggling. And then we realized that Holland has the most beautiful tulips in the world. She goes, we're learning to see the tulips in Lizzie's life. At this moment, this woman is crying. My wife is crying. The nurse that's on duty in our room is an emotional dumpster fire. (laughs) And I'm crying. Great. And I think about this from time to time. Be thankful in all circumstances. God, you're here at Clark Summit University because you love God. Hopefully. And you want to study with the Bible as the foundation of your education so you can go out and please him in whatever field you choose. Three responses that you're going to need in life is that you need to be joyful always. You need to pray continually. And you need to be thankful in all circumstances. And God could use you. He's going to take you through tough times. It seems like in our life, we're either going into a trial, through a trial, or out of a trial of various degrees as we live, right? And your responses can point people to God and how you respond to them. Because an unbelieving world, they want to see the inconsistencies in our life. And they're there. But with God's spirit that he's given to us to come and dwell us, we can have victory over sin and we can put 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18 into practice in a daily, practical manner. I pray that you do that for his honor and glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the power of your word. I thank you that we can overcome these things. Our flesh, you know my flesh, I want to complain, I want to focus on me. I pray that we are joyful always and that we are on our knees before you. I pray that you change our focus and as a result, that we're truly thankful. As we live here on this earth, while we're here, I ask that we put these things into practice. In your son's name, amen.